Out east, Tokyo Stock Exchange recovering from their network collapse, losing a day's trading, while over at NASDAQ they're saying, for trading, go west. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction of highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the week's many events and happenings can be found in Exchange Invest's daily subscriber newsletter, the unique guide to the bourse business sent daily to your inbox. More details for subscriptions and a free trial at exchangeinvest.com. The Jersey tax spat exploded this week. Amidst all manner of threats that they were on their way to Chicago, the media was excited and intrigued at the Midwestern move. Whereas in reality, the truth came out later in the week. Go west, say Nasdaq. They're in talks with Texas Governor Abbott about relocating their trading systems in a mega move to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. As I noted when this whole farrago first started, the rich opportunity for Nasdaq and US trading venues is to go west, far, far west from New Jersey and the tri-state area. Find a stable, low-tax environment. Texas maintains 0% state income tax, affirmed indeed by a referendum last year. They have a pro-business environment, and indeed Bob may be your father's brother, subject only to the usual statements of gender recognition, gender determination, equal relationship status, and so forth. I'm delighted to hear Nasdaq are examining their options, as doubtless are other venues, with a view to a next-gen situation which will clearly diminish the New York area's financial centre status. And that all comes at a time when I hear talk of new international financial centres in many locales, including perhaps not that far from Nasdaq's current centre of attention, according to this week's reports. Meanwhile, the most of the week comes from Nasdaq's communications VP, Joe Kristinat. Referring to Nasdaq, we are assessing all our options, but our number one priority is protecting the US capital markets and its investors. Amen to that. Go west. The tri-state may yet remove the current tax threat, but their fiscal base is already eroding. It's only a matter of time before they return to any tax they possibly can. The same goes for Illinois. Hence, the message of the week is go west. And indeed, Charles Schwab, they're on the verge of completing their TD Ameritrade acquisition. And it's time for them to chuck the West Coast to another haven of bankrupt US state government. Charles Schwab expects Westlake in Texas to become their official corporate headquarters address from January the 1st, 2021. In other bad news for New York, Thomson Reuters, they're looking to sell their 50% stake in their Times Square headquarters at the epicenter of New York's Manhattan district. It's not so long ago that Reuters was moving that headquarters to be in New York City from London, as that seemed to be the epicenter of the world then. Of course, it worked for the then CEO and his acolytes, I suppose. But now that dream appears to be dying along, sadly, with a great city which is in real difficulty after an absence of budgetary coherence even before COVID hit the city hard. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome wherever you find this podcast. In deals this week, lots and lots of rumours. The European Union are trying to maximise the stress of the LSE. They're about to be told, sometime soon, coming soon, minor attractions next season. Who knows, somewhere over the horizon. We won't be singing at the LSE in Paternoster Square, I imagine. They'll be looking to the antitrust objections they're going to get over the Refinitiv deal. What they are, who knows. But they are, apparently, according to leaks from Brussels, looming. Elsewhere, Nishex, that's a shipping and transportation exchange, they raised $13.5 million in additional growth financing to expand their offering for shippers across the United States of America and beyond. Meanwhile, the ramifications continued over TPICAP's ill-advised discussions about acquiring the block trading provider of equity markets, LiquidNet. 
However, this ultimately plays out, indeed, whether the TPICAP board actually wishes to go ahead with the bid, let alone if a bid can be agreed, let alone if the shareholders of TPICAP agree to what is going to be a further dilutive and value-destructive move to their already bruised shares, it's clear that confidence in Nicholas Bretto, the CEO of TPICAP, and his executives has now already surely descended to a level that cannot be deemed career-sustaining. The prospect of acquiring LiquidNet by TPICAP amounts to balance sheet toxic stupidity of the first order by a company with a sorry track record of shareholder value destruction in recent years. TPICAP faces the prospect of suicide by deal or losing its management. The latter have demonstrably failed, and indeed there must surely be questions swirling of what the senior NED element knew. Even to suggest this deal in the public domain as a credible negotiation has left TPICAP rightly open to ridicule and indeed clearly showing the company has no idea what to do to improve what is a flawed business model badly executed with no modernization strategy. In new markets this week, two interesting slightly left field plays of Venezuela. They've rolled out an Ethereum based, that's a blockchain cryptocurrency, stock exchange that's to help skirt US sanctions. Elsewhere, the world's first high-frequency decentralized energy market is helping drive the port of Rotterdam's energy provision. It's been jointly developed by S&P Global Platts and BlockLab. It's a new microgrid electricity trading platform leveraging, oh, a great many buzzwords, blockchain, artificial intelligence, you name it. This thing is definitely a buzzword bingo card of technological development. Now, if you don't know one end of a technological development buzzword bingo card from another, but you have appreciated that COVID-19 is a killer, then you will be aware of the fact that COVID-19 might kill your career, but indeed fintech more than certainly is going to destroy your business at some stage in the near future. It's a victory or death world of risk or opportunity. Therefore, 20 years on from the excitement of my original fintech bestseller, Capital Market Revolution, I, Patrick L. Young, invite you to purchase the new tome. Victory or Death, Blockchain, Cryptocurrency and the Fintech World. It's an easy read explaining the differing and diverging role of banks and exchanges, explaining the winning business models of the new world order and placing in perspective just what Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency mean for markets. It's a binary world. Your career will sustain or collapse in the next stage of the digital world. Hence the title, Victory or Death, lest you need reminding of the exciting times for finance and your career in which we are living. Victory or Death is published by DV Books and is distributed by Ingram Worldwide. Meanwhile, don't forget to check in Tuesdays to our live stream, available, of course, as an online videocast on all other days. It's the IPO vid live stream. You can catch the back issues at IPO vid. And the live stream is Tuesdays at 6 p.m. London time, 1300 hours New York time. Available on LinkedIn, Facebook, and indeed, YouTube. Over in Cryptoland this week, this CFTC, the American federal crackdown on the crypto exchanges, became much, much more of a reality. BitMEX, the owners of that legacy exchange, have been charged with illegally operating a cryptocurrency derivatives trading platform and various violations of anti-money laundering laws. A period in the orange jumpsuit fraternity looks to be looming for a series of pioneers in the cryptocurrency marketplace. I've long mused that the first wave of these cryptocurrency markets would end with the initial bubble survivors in a collective group, referred to as the accused. That seems to be playing out now, and likewise, I suspect COVID caused a slowdown in what I was pretty convinced would be a US Fed lockdown of the crypto kiddies during Q1 this year. Orange jumpsuits all round by the looks of it, and frankly, not a moment too soon. Elsewhere, various people were pondering the death of the marketplaces in crypto. Apparently, some 75 crypto exchanges have died already in 2020. More will clearly follow. Indeed, I'm minded to ponder, only 75 dead so far? Compare that against the People Bank of China. Their digital currency has already been used for transactions worth 1.1 billion Chinese yuan. Product news this week. The UK's watchdogs, they've been telling markets, prepare for LIBOR's demise. Globally, the blob are standing in front of their mirrors each morning, reciting a new rendition of the famous Monty Python sketch. This is a dead LIBOR. It has ceased to be novated, margined, or settlement. 
Bereft of counterparties, it is gone to meet its maker, etc., etc. Actually, if you want to catch up with some of the interesting discussions about the short-term interest rate world, look to IPOVID008. This week, we were talking to Andy Ross, the CEO of The Curve Global Enterprise. That's a platform and exchange looking to revolutionize short-term interest rate trading based under the organization, the aegis of the London Stock Exchange Group. Fascinating discussion all round with Andy Ross there. You can catch it online at YouTube, IPO-vid. Elsewhere, big influx of money into Hong Kong. Hong Kong deposits surged by some US $50 billion during August alone on what is now the Hong Kong Exchange's IPO magnet. That, of course, coming ahead of the Ant Financial IPO, which we're looking forward to being the biggest IPO of all time in the coming weeks. Elsewhere, The Options Clearing Corporation, they've already announced a new exchange-listed options industry volume record, and that's based only on the data up to the end of September 2020. Think of what they'll manage by the time we get a whole extra quarter in on the year. Ice Benchmark Administration, they've launched a beta version of the British pound Sonia Ice swap rate. Fascinating stuff there for the post-LIBOR universe. And NASDAQ, they've launched VOLQ, the next generation index, which is, I believe, going to replace the rather aged and less accurate VIX in the near future for all those people who are mavens on trading what goes on in the world of volatility. Finally, in product news this week, While the German stock exchange is proposing tougher rules after the Wirecard scandal, which could, of course, prove to be a poisoned chalice precisely because they have a tendency to over-regulate when there's nobody willing to put their career on the line to save anything around at DB1. QV, remember what happened to Neuermarket in the fiasco after the dot-com bubble collapsed. Deutsche Börse are also proposing expanding their DAX 30 index to 40 companies. I suppose that provides extra diversification for the index when one of your members happens to be something like Wirecard and goes bust unexpectedly as a result of a monumental fraud hidden in plain sight in what might be referred to as Germany's somewhat quixotic corporate culture. Technology news this week was entirely dominated by the Tokyo Stock Exchange's collapse. A failure in a Fujitsu system has led to a great deal of buying, scraping, the forming of a committee, and vast outrage as Tokyo's financial hub definitively lost face in its worst outage ever, with no trading whatsoever for one whole day last week. As Finance Minister Taro Aso told reporters in Tokyo, exchanges are a crucial part of market infrastructure, and it's unacceptable that trading opportunities were denied. In regulatory news this week, well, while the OCC is announcing record volumes in options trading, the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, their regulators have posted a record-breaking enforcement year. And that's without even trying to crack down on exchange failures such as the West Texas Intermediate Cushing crisis at the CME earlier this year. Elsewhere, the UK confirmed their ban on Bitcoin-based products for retail investors. While I'm never inclined to endorse the myopic analogue-era bans of the FCA, they simply drive business underground, methinks. This is a clear reaction to what is a highly dubious clutch of crypto derivatives exchanges, which offer none of the CCP protection at all compared to the mainstream legacy bourses. QV, of course, the BitMEX arrests this week in the USA. Frankly, crypto looks sleazy, despite the daily inbox welter of investment-grade markets with press releases coming from what are often, sadly, quite sleazy entities themselves. There are exceptions, of course, but they are, by definition, rare in the crypto exchange marketplace. At the same time, the argument of the FCA that because people lose money in the product set, thus it must be banned, is either, frankly, moronic or inspired genius. QV. Most supporters see their football teams lose more often than they win over any prolonged period. Does that mean we can ban soccer to save supporters their pain? One big name move in People News this week, Kees Vermaas. He's formerly the head of your next Amsterdam. He dived out of that situation just ahead of the IPO when it was being spun out of ice all those years ago. He then joined CME Europe to become the CEO of their short-lived futures exchange. And now he's going to be moving to Guernsey in the Channel Islands off the coast of the UK and France to become the CEO of the dynamic small listings venue, the International Stock Exchange, formerly, of course, the Channel Islands Stock Exchange. All the very, very best to Keith, a likeable Dutchman who is the first parish veteran CEO that the International Stock Exchange Group has had in its relatively brief but dynamic history. 
And thus, ladies and gentlemen, we end up at a very brief review of what's going on in another busy week in markets. As I said, if you want to know all the stories, then you need to be emailing me, Patrick L. Young, find me on LinkedIn or elsewhere, or going to the exchangeinvest.com website and applying for a free trial in order that you can read Exchange Invest, the daily market newsletter, the only Bourse Business Digest, and indeed the Bourse Business Digest that can keep you often weeks ahead of the news and analysis of what's going on in the markets. However, before I leave you this week, ladies and gentlemen, one macro story struck us this week. The European Union is pinning its hopes on markets to absorb the bank loans hit by coronavirus. The Hail Mary pass of the European Union economies from central banks and regulatory authorities looks to be the growing order of the foreseeable future. And on that mysterious and magnificent note, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patrick L. Young. I wish you a great week in markets. I hope to catch up with you via the pages of our daily email newsletter, Exchange Invest, during the week. But if not, we'll be back again next week with another Exchange Invest weekly podcast. Have a great week in markets. This show relates to the business of bourses. It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our program, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.